Gospel of St. John, chapter number 14, verse number 1. There you will find our assignment for this morning. It is not often that we go to John 14 without a casket in front of the building, but we're going there today because there's something that God wants us to learn out of the text. Uh, it is John 14. I wanted to read the whole verse, but I figured it might be too much for you. So I got 16 through 27 in the hopes that you might at your own leisure go through the whole context from which the text is extrapolated and thereby gain extra wisdom as to what Jesus is summarizing to his disciples right before he exits. You know the text, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house there are many mansions there. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go. Yeah, see I knew you knew it. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. My cousin's funny. <laughs> Thank God, I didn't see you, man. Give God for my cousin in the house. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen, yeah. Go over here and take a picture of him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Philip said, have I been so long time with you? Philip said, show us the Father, and it show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus said, have I been so long time with you, and you still don't know that I and my Father are one? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, for I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. My God, that's some good stuff. We're going to start at the 16th verse. I was up above it, but we're going to go to 16, and we're going to read it out in the Amplified Bible because the Amplified Bible does just that. It amplifies the text so that you can see that the particular words that are invested in the text have variances of meaning that you might get a deeper, richer, and fuller experience as you go into the Word of God. The Gospel of St. John, chapter 14, verse 16, when you have it, say amen. amen. If you can't find it, say pray for me. <laughs> Don't fake it. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby. Good God of mercy. You gonna let me have a comforter, a helper, an advocate, an intercessor, a counselor, a strengthener, a standby to be with you forever. Let's go on. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive and take it and take to its heart because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he, the Holy Spirit, remains with you continually and will be where? Will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, comfortless, bereaved, and helpless. I want to read that again. I will not leave you as orphans, comfortless, bereaved, and helpless. I will come back to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will. You will see me because I live. You will live also. On that day, when that time comes, you will know for yourselves that I am in my Father, and ye are in me, and I am in you. Come on. The person who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who really loves me. 
No shenanigans, no slipping, sliding, ducking, hiding, night riding, but the one who keeps my commandments and really keeps them is the one who really loves me. And whoever really loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and reveal myself to him. I will make myself real. Jesus is real to me. So many people doubt him, but I can't live without him. Jesus is real to me. I will make myself, I will make myself real to him. Come on. Judas, not his chariot, asked him, Lord, what has happened that you are going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, if anyone really loves me, he will keep my word, my teachings, and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our dwelling place with him. Ooh, ain't that something that God says, I and my father, we will come together and make our dwelling place with him. Do you know God lives with you? One who does not really love me does not keep my words. And the words, the teaching which you hear is not mine, but it's the Father's who sent me. I have told you these things while I am still with you. But the helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place to represent me, in my place to represent, in my place to represent me and act on my behalf. He will teach you all things and he will help you remember everything that I have told you. Peace. I leave with you. I felt anxiety leave out the room when I said that. Peace, I leave with you. My perfect peace, I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. Let my perfect peace calm you in every circumstance and give you courage and strength for every challenge, good God Almighty. You can go home now. <laughs> That's the sermon all by itself. What fascinated me about the text is that when it said that Jesus said, I will not leave you as an orphan. I will not abandon you. I will not leave you as orphans comfortless, bereaved, and helpless. I will come back to you. He's setting us up for the advent of the Holy Spirit to take up residence in the world, our advocate, our helper, our standby. And this morning, I'm going to call him the guardian. My subject is the guardian. Eternal and all wise God, we come before you now, as humble as we know how, asking you to sanctify the word in our hearts. Let the word bring forth fruit in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. Yeah, I'm home. First time I used this text publicly, I was 19 years old, preaching a funeral for a 17-year-old boy who was killed in a car wreck. I brought the family in, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many mansions there. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, ye may be also. And anytime we associate a text with a circumstance, 
sometimes we compromise the context from which the text is taken because our point of reference is limited to homegoing services and funerals. But in actuality, this is not a text of bereavement. This is not a text that is meant to comfort people in times of emotional chaos and distress. This is a text that is given to explain to a nervous and restless group of disciples the feeling of abandonment that they are facing. The time has come in their life for Christ to step away in his physical form and they are being weaned from him. Much like many of the soldiers who go off to war and they kiss their kids and their wives goodbye and say, let not your heart be troubled. I will come back to you. It is the promise that he gives on his exit that they are not abandoned, but that he will give them a guardian, another comforter, an alos pericletes, one who stands alongside to help and to aid and to give comfort. He is there to make sure that you don't suffer in my physical absence. He is there and has been with you and shall be in you. It was interesting to note that one of the fullest classes that we had on Wednesday night has been on the Holy Spirit itself. Because we want to activate the Holy Spirit, we want to know that he is more than goose pimples and chill bumps, but that he is a resident force in our lives. He's not a feeling in our lives, he is a force in our lives. He is not an emotion, he is the personality of God revealed through human bodies. He is the light that lights the lantern. We are the lantern, but he is the light. I was looking at the moon last night, it was a quarter moon out, and it was just glowing so beautifully in the night. And I said to a friend of mine, I said, the moon has no light of its own. It has no light of its own. It is at the mercy of its ability to see the sun. And to the degree to which it sees the sun, it illuminates in direct proportion to that visibility that it experiences with the sun. The only reason it is only lit to a quarter is because of the obscurity of the vision. So the clearer the vision, the brighter the light. So you might have some half moon Christian right now that are going to get a vision that's going to take them to half moon that takes them to, oh, uh, y'all don't, don't get it, to, to, to full moon if you keep walking with him. So the moon is just a reflection of the sun in another part of the world. And that's what we are to be created in his image, a mirror, a reflection of his glory. There are many things and one of them we're gonna talk about today is a reflection of his glory. What's going to help us to understand is that this is an allegory in its essence as a story or a picture or a piece of art that uses symbols to convey a hidden or ulterior meaning, typically a moral or political one. This is an allegory. In other words, it's, I'm not saying that it didn't happen, I'm saying that it has a double meaning. In its most simple and concise definition, an allegory is when a piece or visual or narrative media uses one thing to stand in for a different hidden idea. The reason that the idea is hidden from us is that what Jesus is saying is consistent to what the bridegroom would say to the bride. Okay, because in Jesus' day, they took marriage a little differently than we do today. At the time you were engaged, you were actually married, even though the marriage hadn't been consummated. That time period, you had entered into an agreement that was serious and committed. That's why Joseph 
was going to give Mary a bill of divorcement, though he had not yet married her, he had betrothed her. He had entered into commitment with her, and that was a part of the marriage ceremony. What Jesus is saying to the disciples has the reflection and the relevance of what marriage meant in the Bible days. Can I go deeper? Marriage mimics the gospel. It is a shadow of how God brings us into the commonwealth of Israel. In its purest form, marriage is adoption. Marriage is adoption. When I met my wife, she was Sarita Jameson. But when I married her, I gave her my last name and adopted her into the Jake's family. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You in? Yeah, after 43 years, if it didn't take by now, it's not going to take. <laughs> the whole theme of weddings are important to God. Marriage is important to God. It means a lot to God. Your marriage is important to God, but marriage in general as an institution is important to God because it mimics his relationship with us not your marriage. Marriage itself <laughs> mimics his relationship with us. The church is often called the bride of Christ for that reason. All throughout the Bible, God talks about marriage over and over again. From the book of Genesis, where he begins, uh, the very first thing he does before he establishes the church before he establishes a community, he starts with marriage. He puts Adam into a deep sleep, pulls a rib out of his side and makes Eve to be his bride and performs the first marriage in the book of Genesis. From the book of Genesis to the book of Revelations, where we had the marriage supper of the Lamb, the whole Bible is full of inferences and references to marriage. In the second chapter of John, it opens with the marriage at Cana. So we see marriage in Genesis. We see marriage in Revelations. We see marriage in the Gospel of St. John. We see it over and over again. We see references to marriage. He tells one prophet to go and marry a harlot. It is not so much that he wants the prophet to be married to the prostitute, but he is trying to show us an image an allegory of what he is going through being married to his people. Maybe your marriage he is using as an allegory to show you what it feels like for him to be married to us. I told you they wasn't gonna like this message. So the second chapter of John opens with Jesus at the marriage at Cana. In the times of Christ, a Jewish wedding was a joyous and important event that typically lasted for several days. Days. I don't know how they afforded it. We did it in one day and I almost went broke. The wedding was typically held in a couple's home or in a rented space or in a banquet hall or a palace. The day of the wedding was considered a holiday and many friends and people would come to celebrate this particular uh, magnanimous occasion. The wedding started with the betrothal, which was a simple ceremony where the couple would pledge to marry each other. It started way back then. Some marriages took longer than others. After the betrothal, the couple would wait for a few months or even years for the wedding to take place. During this time, the couple would prepare for the wedding and not just the couple, but the bridegroom would go and build a house for his wife because he understood that it was his responsibility to provide. So I want to be sure you get this. So he engaged her, but he says, I can't marry you. I have to go prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself 
that where I am, there ye may be also. And so Jesus is speaking in language that is familiar to the Jewish people. He's speaking groom talk. He's speaking groom talk. He says, in my father's house, there are many mansions there. If it were not so, I would have told you so, but none of them are suitable for you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye may be also. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Hallelujah. That this, this is marriage talk. This is wedding talk. This is what the wedding ceremony is symbolic of. When we say that the wedding is sacred is not sacred because Jimmy and Susie are standing there because Jimmy might not be sacred and Susie might not be s sacred either. But the, 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 they could be. I'm not taking anything away from them. But the institution itself is an icon and an allegory of a relationship that has a much deeper meaning than what society is talking about today. This is not a sociological or a political issue. From the text, it is a theological issue. It always was and it always will be because marriage is a picture of the relationship that God has with us in that he has adopted us and given us his name. Did he, did he not say, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, that will I do? Did he not say, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus? He's given us his name as a sign of betrothal, of adoption. I will not leave you orphaned. I will not leave you doubting who you are. I will not leave you at the mercy of anybody else accepting you in order for you to be whole. I will come to you. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? On the day of the wedding, the bride and the groom would start their day with the church service, followed by a procession to a wedding ceremony. They would go through all of these routines. The wedding ceremony typically took place in a synagogue, and it was led by a rabbi. During the ceremony, the bride and groom would exchange vows and make promises to each other, make promises to each other. No wonder we have precious promises. He made promises to us like any groom would make to his bride. Precious promises have been extended to you. And the good thing about his promise, he always keeps his promises. He said, I'm not a man that I should lie or the son of man that I should repent. Have I not spoken it? Shall I not perform it? Have I not said it? Will I not make it good? After the wedding ceremony, there would be a grand feast which was attended by the family and the friends and the members of the community. The feast typically lasted for several days. That's why you hear the book of Revelations talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is a celebration of after the wedding has taken place, we go into the marriage supper of the Lamb. In fact, on, cro on the cross, Jesus was giving his body to his bride. Oh, you're going to get with me in a minute. On the cross, he was giving his body to the bride. In the resurrection, the bride will give her body to, to him, and we will enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions there. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. Remember when Jesus rose from the dead and Mary saw him out in the garden and she called him Rabboni and he said, touch me not for I have not yet ascended to my Father. What he means by that is, I've got to put the blood on the mercy seat. I've got to sanctify a place for you. I've got to consecrate a, a place for you that where I am, there ye, be, there ye may be also. So don't contaminate my blood with your touch because I'm on a mission. I've made a promise that I've got to go to prepare a place for you. I did not rise from the dead just to prove to you that I am Lord. I rose from the dead so that my perfect, holy, spotless blood could hit the mercy seat and prepare a place for you to be able to dwell in the presence of the Lord. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? 
So all the friends and the family would gather around for the supper that came at the end. It was a celebration of love, of the commitment of the bride and groom. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? So the Jewish wedding took quite some time to take place. That's where you get the parable about the five wise and the five foolish virgins who kept their oil lamps trimmed and burning, waiting for the bridegroom cometh because no man knew the day nor the hour that the bridegroom would come back. They knew he was coming back. They knew he had promised to come back. They knew he had betrothed us. They knew that he had declared to us that we were his. They didn't know how long it would take him to prepare a place, but we were supposed to keep our lamps trimmed and burning for we did not know what day the master would come back for us. And this is why the Holy Spirit is so important to us because keeping your lamps trimmed and burning is an indication of having oil in your lamp. Oil in your lamp is keeping yourself ready so that whenever he comes, if he comes before I get through preaching, if he comes before I close the service, if he comes before you leave the parking lot, if he comes in a suddenly, in a immediately, if he comes in a flash, we'll be ready because we have the oil of the Holy Spirit down inside of us, which is a guardian that lights the way so that we can see the Father. Philip says, show us the Father and it suffices us. Jesus said, have I been so long time with you and you still don't know that I and my Father are one? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. So here I go with my light which is coming from my oil because I have the guardian down inside of me and I can see him. And Philip said, how can we go? We don't know the way. We've never been there. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, save he come by me. And all of the Bible over and over again, there is an emphasis on marriage. Jacob worked seven years that he might have Rachel, and instead he gets her sister, Leah, and has to work another 14 years before he gets Rachel, the love of his life. It took a long time, but he came back for her. We see it over and over again, the importance of marriage in the scriptures is symbolic of a much bigger issue. I am not saying that your marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. I'm saying the institution, the ideology, the concept of marriage itself is a picture of Christ and the church. That did he not say in the Old Testament, I'm married to the backslider. Yeah, you threw him out of the church, but I'm still married to the backslider. That, that, that's why I told the prophet to go marry a prostitute and I let him go redeem her off the slave table because that's what I did with you. I promised you and you went a whoring and had strange children, but I still want you. And if I have to buy you back, that's what redemption means to buy you back. I bought you back off the slave table. You embarrassed me, but I still bought you. You, you, you made me ashamed, but I still brought you. You scandalized my love, but I still brought you. You took my promises for granted, but I still bought you. And if I have to go down to the slave auction and see you standing there butt naked on the table, you're still my wife. Your hair is all over your head. Your makeup is smudged, but you're still my wife. And I will pay the price that is necessary to redeem you unto myself. Notice it is not redemption, it is redemption. I will buy you back. I will pull you out of your mess. I will pull you out of your shame. I will pull you out of your disgrace. I will pull you out of your trouble. I will pull you out. I will snatch you out because you're still mine. Shake your head and say, I'm still his. I messed up, but I'm still his. I blew it, but I'm still his. I haven't been steadfast, but I'm still 
his. He says, I am married to the backslider. So what Jesus is doing in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of St. John is talking to us like a groom talks to his, 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 his spouse, fiance. He said, don't, don't be upset. I know you're in love with me. He said, I'm going away for a little bit, but, 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 but I'm coming back to receive you unto myself. We ain't finished. We, we're just getting started. And, and while I am gone, and while I am gone, I will not leave you as an orphan. I will not leave you in this world by yourself. I will not leave you in this world to deal with witches by yourself. I will not leave you in this world to deal with devils by yourself. I will not leave you in this world to face diseases by yourself. I will not leave you in this world to have to fend for yourself. I will leave you an advocate, a comforter, a standby. I will leave you somebody, a guardian that stands in for you until I return again. You are protected, you are covered, you are sealed, you are connected. He is in you, glory to God. He is inside of you, protecting you. You might not always sense him, but the devil knows that you're anointed. The devil already knows that there's oil in your lamp. The devil already knows that there's glory down inside of you. Did not the Bible say, Paul I know and Jesus I know but who are you? That means that the devil can, can really detect when you have had an encounter with God. There are certain things he can't do to you because you're covered by the blood. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? So the Bible said that when the sons of God came around the throne, along with them also came Satan and Jesus, and God asked him, where have you been? He said, I've been going to and fro and up and down, seeking, watch this, whom I may devour. If you gotta seek who you can, then there's gotta be somebody who you can devour. The reason you're still here is but he couldn't devour you. The reason you made it through your test is because he couldn't devour you. The reason he didn't take you out is because he couldn't devour you. The devil can only devour some people. A thousand may fall at your right side. 10,000 will fall at your left side, but it will not come nigh you because I've got a guardian around you. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? So, so Satan, otherwise known as Lucifer, says, I've been going to and fro up and down throughout the earth, seeking whom I may devour. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, come on, please. You know I can't do nothing with him. You got the guardian around him. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You've got a hedge all around him. You've got protection all around him. I can't even get to him. I can't get to his property. I can't get to his children. I can't get to his body. I can't get to his mind. I can't get to his emotions. Because you've got, you've got that force field around him. You've got that protection around him. You've got that courage. That's why you didn't die of crib death. That's why you didn't die at an early age. That's why you made it through three trimesters. That's why you made it through adolescence and puberty. Because God had a guardian around you. You were not orphaned in this world. You were not alone in this world. You were protected in this world. I need about a thousand protected people that will... somebody and tell them I've been protected all my life. 
I may have gone through trouble, but trouble didn't go through me. I may have had a hard time, but it didn't prevail over me. I've been protected all my life. When the enemy came in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord lifted up a standard against it. I've been protected all of my life. I never had to fight for myself because the battle was not mine. It belonged to God. And every time they thought they had me surrounded, I looked again and I was surrounded by him. I've been covered on the right. I've been covered on the left. I've been covered on the north. I've been covered on the south. I've been covered while I was sleeping. I was covered even when I was wrong. I was covered when I made mistakes. I was covered in my foolishness. So when you see me praising God, don't think I'm praising God because I'm crazy. I'm praising God because I'm protected. I want somebody to take 30 seconds and just forget the just, 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 just. Not only has he covered me, he's covering me right now. Touch your neighbor and say, God's got you covered. Whatever you're worried about, God's got you covered. Whatever is getting on your nerves, God's got you covered. Whatever the devil is threatening you with, God's got you covered. Hallelujah. The host should encamp against me. My heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me. Will In this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the that I may dwell in the, that I may dwell in the, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of, his, of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies, and I will sing, I will sing praises unto my God. Somebody sing a praise to your God right now. The Bible says that Herod's daughter danced before the king. And the king said, if you dance before me, you can have whatever you want. And she said, I want the head of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist lost his head because that daughter found her dance. Let me tell you something. If you dance before the king, he will cut the head off of your enemy. No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper and every tongue that rises against you, God will condemn. I know you're quiet. I know you're conservative. I know you're reserved. I know you're intelligent. But when you're in a fight with the devil, sometimes you got to dance for his head. You got to dance for a breakthrough. You got to dance for deliverance. I'm going to take 30 seconds for a praise break. Because there might be something you want to kill. There might be something you want to annihilate. There might be something you want to destroy. There might be something you want to take out. There might be something you want to get out of your way. There might be something that you want to annihilate. And I dare you to dance before the king. Look at your neighbor and say, don't make me go to dancing. 
If I go to dance and no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. If I go to dance and yokes will break. If I go to dance walls will come down. If I go to dance doors will open. If I go to dance God will behead my enemy. If I go to dance God will give me the victory. I'm not in this thing by myself. I better stop because I feel something pushing me in the back. Hallelujah. I feel like giving God a praise in this place. I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished yet. I feel something in this place, so I'm not finished, but I feel something in this place. I feel something in this place. I feel an unction in this place. I feel the guardian in the room right now. I feel it. 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 I feel somebody, the devil's been trying to tell you you are orphan. But the devil is a lie. God said, I will not leave you an orphan. Hallelujah. I will send an alos pericletus, one who stands alongside to help. One who stands alongside to help, like God parents do with parents at baby dedications. They stand alongside to help. They have a responsibility that if something would happen to the parents, the guardians step in to make sure that the decisions for the child are taken care of. Like the executive over a will or an estate, they step in as a guardian to make sure that the will is taken care of according to the testator who left a will for the children. The executive over the will is there to make sure that everybody gets what they're supposed to get. The the Holy Ghost is there to make sure that everybody gets what they're supposed to get. You don't have to worry about nobody getting your stuff. You don't have to worry about nobody getting your life. You don't have to worry about nobody getting your job. You don't have to worry about nobody getting your blessing because the Holy Ghost is the executive over the estate. And whatever the testator has willed for you to get, you're going to get it. Can I get a good hand clap for the testator? Sit down, I'm going to go further. Jesus' conversation was so real to the apostles that they were expecting his return at any moment. When they stoned Stephen, the Bible said that Stephen, while they were stoning him in his face, he wasn't looking at the rocks but he looked up into the heavens and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. And once he saw Jesus, the rocks didn't make any difference at all because he remembered that he had a promise from the Lord. 
Anybody, you got some rocks thrown at you right now, but you got a promise from the Lord. Look above the rocks and see that God is still with you. Does somebody say he's still with me? You hit me, but he's still with me. You talking about me, but he's still with me. You scandalizing me, but he's still with me. You don't like me, but he's still with me. You crush me, but he's still with me. Shout yes! The last days were so paramount in the mind of the disciples that when, when Peter started preaching on the day of Pentecost, he reminded them, he said, this is that which the prophet Joel spoke of, that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see this. This is that which the prophet Joel spoke of in the last days. The last days started then. You up here talking about we're in the last days. We're not in the last days. We're in the last seconds. The Apostle Paul, who was a new convert, who had been uh, a follower of Judaism all his life, a uh, Hebrew and zealous concerning the law, when he was converted on the road to Damascus, the very first book he wrote was the book of Thessalonians. So don't read Paul's writings in the order that they are in your Bible. The first writing of Paul came from Thessalonians. And he says, he says that day will appear but not before the man of sin is revealed because all Paul knew is that the groom was coming back. It was years before he understood the death, burial, and resurrection. It was years before he understood justification by faith. It was years before he understood the fruit of the Spirit. It was years before he understood the gifts of the Spirit. But while he was still in Corinth trying to establish a church, he wrote Thessalonians because the one thing he was sure of is that he was coming back. The guardian had not yet reminded him of all that Jesus taught. So as Paul's understanding increases, his epistles increased. But the one thing he understood from the beginning is that he's coming back again. Tell somebody and say he's coming back again. He's coming back again. He's coming back. You, you'd be surprised how differently people would live if they really believed he was coming back again. You'd be surprised at the habits you say you can't quit, that you would quit if you believe that Jesus was coming back again. You'd be surprised at the people you wouldn't cuss out if you believe that Jesus was coming back again. You'd be surprised the people you wouldn't do evil to if you really believe that Jesus was coming back. Because the Bible said, if you really believe what I said, you will keep my commandments. Not, not you will dance, not you will shout, not you will holler, but the sign that you really believe me and that you really love me is that you obey me. Oh, I lost you. Let me try you. Obedience is a sign of love. Obedience is a sign of love. Obedience is a sign of love. So that's why obey him is in the vow. It's not because he's smarter than you. It's because your marriage is playing a role. And the bride is the church. And as the bride, the Bible, include, we include the word obey into it because obedience is a sign of love. It's not that you're any lesser. It's not who makes the most money. It's not anything that society is talking about today. That's why the text said that society cannot see me. 
You're trying to make the culture see the Christ. The culture can't see the Christ. The culture only sees what's fair, what's right, according to the norms of the times that you're living in. But this is not about you and Harry. This is not about you and Boo Boo. This is not about you and Frankie. This, this, you're, you're just an icon. You're just a, a symbol. The union is a symbol of a far deeper principle and allegory that has way more strength in it than your personality does with his. This is not about you. I'm not obeying nobody. This is not about you. Your marriage because it becomes a symbol of a struggling church to obey the Lord. No, no, uh, let me go deeper. Husbands, love your wives as I told you playing a role as Christ has loved the church and gave himself a ransom for it. I wish y'all would stop complaining about obeying because you got the best deal. It told the men to love you like Christ loved the church. Christ died for the church. And if you stay married long enough, I say, if you stay married long enough, you're going to have to die. What you would do, what you'd like to do as a man, what you'd like to say, how you'd like to respond has to die because you're playing a role. Husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church and gave himself a ransom for it. Can I preach this thing this morning? So God establishes the, the marriage as a prophecy that has meaning behind it because it is symbolic of Christ and the church. I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there ye may be also. Whether ye go, you do not know, but I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, save he come by me. Jesus is talking language that they understood. He's talking marriage talk. The reason it sounds like funeral talk is that we are in a different culture. So we bring bodies in saying, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many mansions there. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place. We don't even know what we're talking about. What we're really talking about is the promise of the betrothed Christ to the church. What we're really talking about is the dilemma Joseph was in because before he could build the house, Mary got pregnant and he said, let me give her a bill of divorcement privately to put her away. Because had he finished the house, she wouldn't have had Jesus in a barn. He didn't have a prepared place for her. So she rode on a donkey. I feel like preaching this morning. She rode on a donkey. 
because everything was going down so fast. And said, he said, well, maybe I should divorce her. But, but the angel said, don't divorce her. That that is in Mary was conceived by the Holy Ghost. And it put him in a dilemma because he hadn't prepared a place for her. So he said, he, he said, as a guardian, I'm going to have to put you in the inn. But there was no room at the inn. So she had the baby in the barn. But because God is sovereign, he, he meant for her to have the baby in the barn because she didn't really have a baby because babies aren't born in barns. She had a lamb. Come on, come on with me. Come on with me, church. 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 Come on with me. Come on. Come on. Do you know God's got a place for you? God's got a prepared place for you that you are not in this world by yourself. Holler at me. Now behold the Lamb, the precious Lamb of God. Come on, come on, come on. Ah, ah, she's in delivery. Ah, ah, and they wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And he was born in a manger while shepherds were outside tending the flock. They were tending a lamb, but she was having the precious lamb, the precious lamb, the precious lamb, the precious lamb. Come on, come on, come on, come on. The precious lamb. Oh! That's what I'm telling you. Anybody glad you came to church this morning? I remember when I used to have to go out and speak a lot. I was going all the time and my kids were real small and they never liked for me to go preach, you know. And they, they felt like I was leaving them. They didn't understand I was taking care of them, but they, they felt like I was leaving them. They grabbed my legs and said, Daddy, don't go. Daddy, don't go. I'd have suitcases at the door, daddy don't go. I said, I'm, I'm, coming, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. But I left you with your mother. I didn't leave you by yourself. I left you with your mother. You're in good hands. And this is what Jesus is saying to his disciples. He said, I'm not gonna leave you by yourself. You're not gonna be without a guardian. You're not going to be without a protector. You're not without somebody who's going to feed you. You're not without somebody who won't fight for you. You're not without somebody who won't take care of you. But Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. Can I go deeper with this thing? Do you not realize that the Holy Spirit is your guardian? Protecting you in the weight? that the anointing of God in your life is there to protect you in the weight so that people can get a lock of your hair and can't curse you. So that they can make a doll that looks like you and stick pins in it, but you can't feel it because you got the Holy Ghost. Because you got the Holy Ghost down on the inside. You are still here. Some of you are the only one in your family that survived. But because of the Holy Ghost, you are still here. The disease that runs through your family ran into a wall when it ran into the guardian that's standing up to protect you from all hurt, harm, or danger. 
touch seven people and say, I'm protected. I'm protected. I'm protected. God's got me covered. I am protected. You ought to put ADT. You ought to put ADT on your shirt and let hell know this house is protected. Don't try to burglarize me because God has got me protected. I wish I had a thousand people with the Holy Ghost in this place that would thank God for the guardian that you have over your life. The only reason you're not turning tricks is that the guardian kept you when you wouldn't keep yourself. The only reason you don't have a needle in your arm is because the guardian protected you when you wouldn't protect yourself. Slap somebody and tell them I'm glad I got the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Spirit every day and every hour. You need him to watch over you. You need him to protect you. You need him to guide you. You need him to be a fence all around you. You need him to be by your side. You need him to make a way out of no way. Somebody ought to thank him for the Holy Ghost my guardian, my advocate, my comforter, my stand alongside, my help in ages past. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is on you now, both to do and to will according to his own good pleasure. I know there are a few witches in here, but I'm not scared of you because I got a guardian angel and because I have a guardian I understand that my root is stronger than your root, that I got more power in the hem of my garment than you have in your pocketbook. I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb. The Spirit of God is all over me and he's keeping me alive. Slap somebody and say the guardian did it. The guardian blessed me with my house. The guardian blessed me with my car. The guardian blessed me with my life. He's just that good. He makes a way for me. He prepares a place for me. He opens doors for me. He provides for me. He protects me. When the serpent tries to bite me, it's the oil that drives the serpent away from me. I'm covered by the oil of God. Somebody shout yes. When I was in Jerusalem, I talked to an old shepherd and the shepherd told me that the sheep are so dumb that they'll stick their nose in the holes and the holes in the ground are where the snakes live. But a good shepherd will take oil and put it on the sheep's head. I said, why do you put oil on the sheep's head? He said, because the oil is a snake repellent. Think of all the things you stuck your head into. But because the oil was on your head, I heard David say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He covers my head with oil. Ah, Satan, you tried to kill me, but I shook it off because I got oil on me. I got snake repellent. Look at your neighbor and say, what are you wearing? Tell him I'm wearing snake repellent. I'm covered with oil. This is not Chanel. This is not Tom Ford. I'm covered with oil of the lamb. I've got a guardian protecting me both day and night. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul should keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul will take. He kept me when I was asleep. He 
kept me when I was under anesthesia. He kept me in the operating room. He kept me in the car wreck. He kept me when my friends were enemies. He kept me when I was surrounded by witches. He kept me when the enemy tried to destroy me. He kept me down through the years. The guardian has made a way for me. The guardian has opened doors for me. The guardian has protected me. I wish I had a hundred people that had the Holy Ghost and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. If you don't like me, I'll be okay because he tells me I'm his own. I'm not an orphan. I'm not alone. I'm not by myself. If you think you got me cornered, the devil is a lie. Hallelujah. God has me surrounded. He's got me covered. He's got me protected. He's got me covered on every side. Hallelujah to God. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I gotta quit, but I feel the power of the Holy Ghost all over this place. He's real. He's real. Jesus is real to me. So many people doubt him, but I, I can't live without him. That is why I love him so. He's so He's real in the morning. He's real at noonday. He's real when the sun goes down. He's real when I don't have a job. He's real in the courtroom. He's real. Somebody shout, he's real. He's real. He's real. If you thought you saw me driving by myself, you wrong. The guardian was sitting right beside me. If you thought I was eating by myself, you're wrong. The guardian is sitting at the table. He's real. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody didn't tell him the guardian did it. Ain't no need in hating on me, the guardian did it. The guardian gave it to me. The guardian protected me. The guardian surrounded me. The guardian guided me. The guardian brought me through the storms, through the rain, through the lightning, through the flood. He's always been there. Every time I turn around, God keeps doing great things for me. Somebody turn around right fast. Every time I turn around, every time I turn around, he's my guardian. He's my king. He's my prince. He's my peace. He's my redeemer. He's my day star. He's my shield. He's my buckler. He's my trumpet. He's my lily in the valley. He's my bright and morning star. He's my kinsman redeemer. He's my bulwark. He's my water in dry places. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is.
Stand on your feet, I'm going to show you something close. Ephesians chapter 5. Put it up there for me. I might not have given it to you. Ephesians 5, find it for me. Uh -huh. I didn't give it to you, but I still know it. Ephesians 5. We're talking about wives obey your husbands. You got it? Yeah. Going down from one and out two. Keep on going. Uh huh. Keep on going. Uh huh. Uh huh. Keep going. Uh huh. Keep going. Uh huh. Uh huh. They're right there. Five twenty-one. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Not not out of who's right or wrong out of reverence for Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Come on. Wives, be subject, be submissive, and adapt yourself. Not to men, to your own husband as a service to the Lord. I know that's not what you're reading in the magazines today, but that's just what the word said. Come on, keep going. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, himself the savior of his body. You, you supposed to see her as your body. Let me show you something, so hold it right there, I'm gonna get the rest of it in a minute. When Adam woke up out of his sleep, before he saw Eve as his wife, he saw her as his body. He says, she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So she is both the body of Adam and the bride of Adam. So when the Bible says that for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church himself, the savior of his body, why are you beating on your body? I never to this day have met a man who beat his woman and loved himself. The reason you are beating on her is that you don't like you. She is your body. 
She is bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. Come on, I'm going to drive this home. As the church is subject to Christ, as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Everything. As the Christ is subject to the church. Now, neither one of us got it real right. Because the church isn't always subject. And the wife isn't submissive. But the role you play does not, does not make you lesser than. But your role is an allegory of Christ and the church. So we're in our parents' closets and we're playing dress up. And, and you act that you didn't put on the church and he has put on Christ and we're acting as the church has loved and submitted to Christ. That's what it's supposed to be. I'm not talking about what it is. Husbands, love your wives as Christ, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I just got to be me. I just got to be me, man. I just got to be me. She don't understand me. She don't understand where I come from. This is how I am. So it's wrong, it's I. You're supposed to do it as, not I. Christ has loved the church so that he might sanctify her. So he, he, he's got to love her like that while she's still not sanctified. So that he might sanctify her. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Watch this. That he might present the church to himself that where I am you may be also. In glorious splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and faultless. If I had time, I, I'd get into this. Some of her purity is your responsibility. A lot of her anger is coming from the fact she has not been loved as Christ has loved the church. How can you submit to somebody who won't be ahead? I'm just saying if you decide to do it the way the Bible said do it, if you decide to do it the way they're doing it now, I can't teach on that. I don't understand that. They're doing something new. I don't, I don't get it. Even so, husbands should love their wives as being in a sense their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. Ladies, stop marrying men who don't love themselves. Because if he don't love him, For no man ever hateth his own flesh, but nourishes and carefully protects and cherishes it as, see where it keeps going back to? As Christ does the church. See, so, so I'm kind of confused because it sounds like he's talking about marriage, but I'm not sure because he keeps going back to as Christ does the church. Come on, give me some more of it. Because we are members, parts 
of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother. Oh yeah, they're talking about marriage. And shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Come on. This mystery, underline that, this mystery is very great. But I speak concerning the relation of Christ in the church. He not even talking about marriage. He's only using marriage as a metaphor to talk about Christ and the church. However, let each man of you, without exception, love his wife. He said, however, it's still good for you. Love his wife as being, in a sense, his very own self, and let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband, that she notices him. This is all you got to do. This is all you got to do. Notice him, regard him, honor him, prefer him, venerate and esteem him, that she defers to him, praises him, and loves and admires him. Exceedingly. Now you got to understand this. He says, I'm really not talking about marriage. I'm talking about Christ in the church, but it's still good medicine for you to understand how it really works. But what I'm really teaching you is, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions there. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye may be also. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. I will not leave you as an orphan, comfortless. Oh, I want that to sink in. I will not leave you. The reason I want it to sink in is because so many of us feel so alone. Jesus said, I will not leave you as an orphan, comfortless. I will give you a guardian, an advocate, one who stands alongside to help. If you need help this morning, you are not alone. The guardian stands alongside to help you. If you've been in a hard place, and you've been trying to do it in your own strength. You're gonna fail at it. Let me tell you something, sisters. You're talking about I'm a strong woman. I'm tough. I don't take no stuff. I wish you. Being strong is overrated. It might be all right for about 10 days or something like that. 
but you get in about 10 years of uh, having to go to the grocery store, argue with the mechanic, carry the groceries up the steps, cook the food, help the kids with homework, drive them to school, go to job, every dollar coming in the house, you gotta bring it, every napkin coming in the house, you gotta buy it, every piece of bread coming in the house, you gotta buy it. It's, it's overrated. Brother, you can't be no man by yourself. Half of you didn't have no example. Half of you didn't have a good example. Some of you had a good example, wouldn't listen to it. Now you're trying to play a role by yourself. Y'all going out to that church, you women going out to church, you should beat her in the door. You're the one that has to prepare a place. You're the one that has to give a ransom for her. You're the one who's supposed to love, cherish, and nourish her. You're the one that's supposed to treat her like you treat your own body. You're not supposed to starve her of your attention, affection. Yeah, I'm starving her because she's starving me. Did he? That you might sanctify her. You're supposed to leave her with no excuse to disrespect you. I'm not excusing her. I'm saying you're not supposed to leave her with no excuse. Some of you gave her a license to cuss you. And then got mad when she used it. The point of the message is, I'm not preaching about marriage. <laughs> I'm just like Ephesians, I'm like Paul. I'm preaching about Christ and the church and that all God is using marriage for is an allegory, marriage in general, not yours. So don't write me anything about your anger. What about, what about when Fred come in at three o'clock? I ain't talking about Fred. It's just an example. A shadow mimics motion, but shows no detail. Earthly marriages, motion and model but do not detail nor fully reflect. We are only talking about shadows, allegories. What we're talking about. I guess, I don't know whether I preach this for you or for me. When my mother died, a long time ago, I'm okay now, but when she died, and my father had been dead. It occurred to me that never again would I be able to walk in somebody's house and just go in the refrigerator. Never again would I have anybody that no matter what I did stupid, they would open up the door and take me in. Never again would I have somebody that I could come to their house at three o'clock in the morning and my mama would swear she wouldn't sleep. <laughs> no, I wouldn't really sleep. <laughs> you hungry? And I felt like an orphan, a 40-year-old orphan. And what really, really made me want to drive this in he said, I suspect that some of you with and without parents, with and without spouses, with and without people, feel like you're in this world all by yourself. And you go to church 
And maybe you even have the Holy Ghost, but you're not really letting him be a guardian. And you feel abandoned, orphaned. And you feel like this is the test. If people really knew who I was, they wouldn't love me. So you don't get the benefit of fellowship because fellowship is hidership. You hidden like torpedoes buried in the bottom of an ocean, dust and dirt all over top of you. And the guardian is standing there with his arms outstretched, saying, come unto me all that are weak and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burdens are light. And I know you got your image to protect and your ego needs a bottle. But if you let go of your ego and your image a minute and you've been fighting like an orphan in an orphanage, everybody. The whole reason your temper is so bad is you don't feel safe. Sounded pretty good. You don't, <laughs> you don't feel safe. And let me tell you something. Fe needing to feel safe is not feminine. Even men. <laughs> need to feel safe. Are you safe to love? Are you safe to take care of? I don't mind giving you a house as long as I know that isn't why you're with me. Truth of the matter is, there are as many lonely married folks as there are single folks. Truth of the matter is, there are as many miserable rich folks as there are desperate poor folks. And the guardian just wants you to be real for a minute and come to this altar and say, I am not going to go out in that parking lot and get in that car alone. I don't care what you say. I am going to get in that car with an awareness that I have been adopted into the royal family and the commonwealth of Israel. And I belong somewhere. I belong somewhere. I fit somewhere. I fit somewhere. I fit somewhere. He has a place for me. Now I've been trying to shove into all of these places and now I realize that the guardian has a place for me. I don't have to spend the rest of my life in a barn. Neither did Jesus. There's a place. God had me preach this to let you know he heard you. This message is a prophetic sign that God heard you.